Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Scott Stedman podcast. Uh, today, um, you know, today I'm just going to speak uh, on my heart a little bit. Uh, hopefully, everyone has enjoyed the um, Camp Marengo story segment we did on here. You know, I know for some of my regular listeners who don't really care about a church camp out in Ohio, um, you know, I debated about should I set up a separate podcast just to do that? But since I knew it was just going to be a short series, it wasn't going to be a, an ongoing series, I decided I might as well just do the stuff on my page, um, on my uh, podcast server, and just do it that way and then continue with my regular scheduled uh, podcast. Um, so hopefully if you listened to them and you enjoyed them, thank you so much. If you didn't care for them and you're just waiting for me to get back to speaking on, um, speaking on like, um, some of the stuff I've normally speak on, then, um, then here you go. Today's the day we were going back to our regularly scheduled program. Um, uh, but, uh, a couple weeks ago, um, there was a situation that happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, where there was a protest going on and it turned uh, violent and there is pictures of people hitting other people, especially white people beating up people of color. Uh, we've seen white people beating up on white people who don't follow their ideology. And we've also seen um, people who have been killed due to being struck by a vehicle. Um, and, and the whole situation is tragic. The whole situation is very tragic because um, it really just kind of shows how much we have not changed um, as a nation. Um, we see so much violence and so much hate on a personal level. And when we see it reflected magnitude on a national scale, it just kind of reflects what's in our hearts. And what I mean by that is that when we see something tragic that has happened within our country or, or within our world, we want to voice our opinion. We want to voice our feelings, our frustration, our, our sadness, our anger about the situation. And so and what has been happening recently, especially with just the evolution of technology and the evolution of social media, uh, we, we have the freedom to be able to voice our opinion to all our friends and even to the entire world um, based on privacy settings that we have uh, set put in place. And the one thing that is really disheartening is that on both sides of the argument, whether it's people who are arguing against for the alt-left or alt-right. I can't even keep them straight anymore because there's just so many terms being thrown around. Um, or them being against Black Lives Matters or All Lives Matters or Blue Lives Matters or whatever, whatever the case may be. It seems like there's always kind of this underlayer of anger, this underlayer of criticism, this underlayer of kind of, I'm going to say what I want, and I really don't care um, if it offends anybody. Um, just recently, like, someone posted, and one of my friends posted something, and it was just, like, two sentences. And when you read it, and when I read it, it was one of those things where it's like, okay, he's making a... He's making kind of a very poignant um, statement. And initially someone was able to say, hey, it seems like the meaning behind the words is very angry. The meaning behind the words is very offensive. And this two sentence phrase kind of sparked this whole thread of debate. And even, even the guy who posted goes, you know, I wasn't trying to mean anything harmful. I wasn't trying to mean anything 
hateful or anything angry. I was just doing it because it was just, um, I posted it because it was just something that I was very curious of, something that I've noticed about kind of the response from leaders, specifically religious leaders on the events of Charlottesville, how it seemed like the events of Charlottesville happened and a lot of people were very quiet, especially a lot of religious leaders were very quiet. And there were some that actually spoke up and condemned uh, what had happened. I know Sunday I preached and through the power of the Holy Spirit, I condemned not only what happened in Charlottesville, but really condemned the church for just people who are hurting, people who are going through a rough time, how we just kind of walk on by them instead of being the good Samaritan to help them. And, you know, it was one of those sermons where the Holy Spirit really led me and I already had a whole different sermon planned. So I can't even recall anything I said. I know luckily someone recorded it's on our church's uh, podcast site. So I'll post a link to that if anyone's interested in listening to to my sermons. Uh, but it was you know, just something like that where something innocent can become just a argued, uh, a point of dissension and a point of discussion, of angry discussion, really just, really just kind of bothers me. And, it, and I think it bothers a lot of people because so much it's almost like the only time we see anything in the news or anything on social media is either passive aggressive memes or people who are flat out being aggressive and saying what they think or they're posting someone else and kind of saying I agree with what this person says and then they share it and then it causes angry faces emojis uh, angry discussions and the like but the one thing that really bothered me about the Charlottesville was actually not I mean, the events bothered me, but there was one thing particular that bothered me personally. And it's something that I have been guilty of. Where when tragedy happens, that tragedy ends up becoming a floor for debate. Tragedy ends up becoming the soapbox for voicing one's opinion and it's almost like here's this tragic event that had happened and as people are reeling from it especially the community when people in the community are reflecting on it and they're licking their wounds and they're trying to heal from this that as they're trying to heal there's other people from all over the world um your regular news person to your president to just your average Joe is standing on top of them voicing their opinions their hurt and their pain becomes a monument for people to be able to stand upon and voice their angry opinion whether it's justified or unjustified and you know I live I live in Stanton Virginia which is about 30 about 30 minutes from Charlottesville and knowing that something like that happened so close just really kind of really bothered me it really bothered me to see people who are 30 minutes away going through all this pain and kind of reeling from all this stuff like even my friend Kate who actually lives out in Charlottesville she was actually cleaning the house and she kept hearing like helicopters and you know was hearing like sirens and you know stuff that you normally hear in the city and actually she said it was weird because one of her friends who I don't know I think one of her friends who lived in Charlottesville and moved over out to California actually called her to say hey are you okay and she's like yeah what's what's going on like She's just in her house having music playing, cleaning, doing whatever, like didn't even turn on the news or anything, had no idea any of this stuff was going on. And when her friend said turn on the TV and she turned on the TV and she saw the news, she was just blown away that all this junk was happening really just two blocks away from her. And it was weird because Monday I actually went to Charlottesville the 
it happened that week and that Monday, I went to Charlottesville and visited some people in the hospital and also went to go visit with Kate. And we're sitting in a sandwich shop. We're sitting at a Zaz, I think it's called Zazus, and off of Ivy Road. And we're just sitting there, we're eating. And it's weird because here I am watching CNN that's on the TV. There's a bunch of other people from Charlottesville sitting there having lunch. And everyone's just kind of staring at the TV and listening to all these people talk about and reflect on the events that have happened in their town. And just looking at their faces, looking at their body language, just kind of processing their hidden emotion, I guess. You could just see that they're just kind of stunned. It was almost like they were dazed and some people would kind of whisper or say something about, but they didn't want to say anything too loud because, you know, they didn't want someone to overhear them and start an argument with them, whether they, about whatever their opinion was on the events. And, and to me, it was just very hurtful. To me, it just seemed like here's all these people who are trying to recover and trying to rebuild, to move on, and to grow from this situation. And it just seems like as you're trying to go, people kept pushing them down with all the stuff that happened. It kept becoming a constant reminder of everything that had gone on. And it's almost it's almost like a kid who's trying to who's underwater and he's trying to get up from air, and as he gets up for air, something else kind of plops on top of him and pushes the kid back down in the water. And they're just try, and all they want to do is just get their head above water to breathe, and it seems like they can't do that. And as I'm sitting there and I'm seeing something that happens so close to home, um, and how even now, like it's been two, it's almost going to be three weeks this Saturday um, that the situation in Charlottesville happened, and. It's still being talked about. I still see stuff on my news feed that people keep talking about it, about what's happening. Or someone posted something like two days after it happened, someone else will comment it on it two weeks after. And it just continues to become this big um, arguing in, in, ang- in, like, in anger and this conflict. And it's just to the point where it's like, just let the community heal. I know my wife on Facebook, she even posts something. She goes, hey, if you really want to help out Charlottesville, she posted a link to their tourism site. Like, come and visit the town. Come and be part of it. Go eat at the restaurants. Go to their landmarks. Walk around UVA. And even said, hey, we're only 30 minutes away. Why don't you come and stay with us? And then you can go to Charlottesville and invest in the community. Because really, that's what we need to do when tragedy happens is we, as Americans, we, especially us as believers in Christ, need to invest in the community that is hurting. I can remember years ago when the school shooting happened in Chardon, and I lived in Cortland, and Chardon's very, pretty far away from Cortland, but it was still kind of in the close proximity. It was probably about a good 45 minutes away. But yet, that was happening, and it was just like, oh. Now, I didn't really feel much of that because it didn't seem like a lot of people were debating if the shooter was in the right or the wrong or, or, or hey, you know, we may get all mad about this alt-right or alt-left group, but what about Black Lives Matter? And then they bring up that debate on, you know, are they the same? Are they different? And, just, and that brings up a whole nother can of worms, and it's just an argument. And it's just to the point where... You know, that didn't happen in Chardon. You know, people were hurt. Churches went out and offered relief. People prayed. And people, and I remember going out to Chardon after, you know, a couple days after the whole situation happened. And I remember just going around. We ate at a restaurant there. I think I bought some beef jerky over at Tom's Beef Jerky Store over there. And I really was investing into the community and just being a part of that community in their, as they were trying to heal from this tragic event. And what really convicted me the most about Charlottesville is there's been times, and you can even go back and look at past episodes of this podcast and even the past episodes of Theology and Backgammon that Ryan and I did. And there would be times, like I can remember the whole thing with South Carolina and the shooter that shot up, killed a handful of people at an African-American church. And I remember going on there and talking about the events and voiced my opinion about this community 
that I didn't even know about that. And I've always, and again, like I'm not the world's popular podcast. Um, not the whole entire world's not listening to the Scott Stedman podcast. Um, but I was but reflecting on the events that happened in Charlottesville and how it hit so close to my community in Stanton. And just seeing how people, my friends from Indiana and Ohio and California and, and all these people are discussing it and having these debates and they're having these arguments over what's happening and they're posting these articles and they're posting these videos and they're posting these memes about the stuff that happened over here in Charlottesville. And I just get to the point where it's just like, guys, shut up. Just shut up and let us heal. I understand that you are upset by it. And I understand that you are praying or you're, or you're mourning with us as this tragedy has happened in Charlottesville. And I get that. And I thank you for your prayers. I thank you. And I know Charlottesville's still trying to recover from it. And it'll probably be a long time. But at the same time, don't make the pain of Charlottesville become a platform to voice your political opinion, your theology, your ideology, your philosophy. Don't let Charlottesville become a point where you're now going to kind of talk about, use your high and mighty voice to kind of talk about the stuff that happened and what we need to do and everything else. Because really what these people want is they want people to pray for them. What the people want is they want people to invest in their community. And even I posted something like, like someone, someone posted something about the thing of Charlottesville and I kind of commented on it. And then another one of my Facebook friends kind of commented because the guy who posted this original thing was a, um, you know, friend of friends. Uh, so some of my friends were able to see me comment on the post and they started to comment on it. And one of the people said that, hey, you know, what's not being reported is that, you know, the majority of the people who came to this protest weren't even from Virginia. And I kind of put a comment on it and I said, true. And then sure enough, two people, two of my friends jumped on it and said, well, it shouldn't matter because it's about race and it's about blah, blah, this and blah, blah, that. And that wasn't the thing. I think the thing is, is there has been a reputation in the South that Southern people are racist. And so when something like this happens, when you have neo-Nazis, the KKK, the alt, whoever is here doing a protest and they're acting out in violence in a southern state, then that just kind of perpetuate that people in the south are racist. And then when people and then when the debate of statues, if they're going to be taken, Confederate statues, if they're going to be taken down or not. And when people in the South say, no, we don't want our flag taken down. We don't want our Confederate statues taken down. It, it then is given the illusion that, oh, that's because Southern people are racist. And that it's because of that. But here's the reality. I've lived in the South for three years. And as I've lived in the South for three years and have talked to people from different political groups, different walks of life, different races, and just had relations with them, not once have I heard any kind of racial, racial slur any type of racial, unsensitive racial comment, or anything of the like. In fact, most of the time, I see there's a lot of positivity. I think there's a lot of, especially in the city of Stanton, there's been a lot of unity between races, between people of different religions, people of different backgrounds, people of different ethnicities. I have seen that. I have been a part of that. And that's something that's very beautiful. But I will tell you what, I have heard a lot more racial slurs or a lot of sexually demeaning comments in the Midwest and Ohio and Indiana than I have heard in 
the South. Now, some people may say, well, you've only lived in the South for three years. You've lived in Ohio for a long time. Yeah, but I went to school in Indiana for four years, and I have heard more, I have seen and heard and experienced more racial slurs and have experienced a lot of racial tension in Indiana at a Christian university than I have in the South. In the Confederate States. So the question is, and sure, even when we look at the tearing down of statues, you know, for a lot of people, it seems like a lot of people who are not from the South see these statues as racist and we should take them down. And if that's your opinion, then, you know, great. But living in the South, I've understand the argument. I've understand the reasoning for not tearing down the statues, because for them it is a sense of Southern pride. For them, it is a sense of a reminder of the things that have happened, and kind of where the South has come from since the days of the Civil War. Now, you could say that maybe I'm just hanging around people who don't have that say, who don't have that view where they see the Confederate statues as a homage to the South and that the South is going to rise again and that slavery is coming back. Like, I don't, whatever the case may be. But for the most part, being in the South, a lot of people, when they explain to me why they are in favor of keeping up the statues, a lot of times it's for, you know, it's, it's for remembrance. Remembrance of where we have come, kind of remembrance of, you know, what had happened during the Civil War, and basically how, we have, how they have grown from, you know, being a state that abused slaves, being a state that owned slaves, to now a state that no longer have slavery, to a state where they can go to school, where people can go to school of different colors and there's no segregation, a, a, a South where there is unity between the whites and the blacks. Like, I, And here's the other thing, and I'm going to say this, and for those of you who are in the Church of God movement, you may be upset by this, but hey, you know what, oh well. Uh, but... When I first came to Virginia to be the pastor of the church of the Church of God in Stanton, one of the things that was told told to me by another um, pastor at this church, a lay minister at this church, is that a couple years ago, that the Church of God in the state of Virginia has decided to reconcile the Caucasian church and the African American church because for lo for so long they have been separate um, so now they have been and so separate to the point where they even had two you had your Caucasian camp and you had your African American camp you had two different camp meetings all in the same state so they decided to unify and they even knew that when they would unify that there would be some issues there would be some point of contention there would be some um, debate that would happen and, and sure enough like I have seen some of that as we tried to be one unified one unified cogba as we call it, Church of God of Virginia that there are some rough edges but we it's it's great when I'm going to pastors meetings and I'm fellowshipping with African American ministers that I see them in leaderships on the state board and that they have a voice and they have an opinion and and I, and I think that's great and it's not perfect and it's it's not perfect but at least we tried at least we're getting there and yet when I was in Ohio there is still kind of this even though on paper we don't see a separation between the black churches and the white churches in the state of Ohio, but there is. When I went to GA and I would look at our on what churches were giving to Ohio ministries, there would be a good handful of African American churches that would not give to Ohio ministries. 
a uh, few of them would, like I know Arlington would give, um, when there would be camp meetings. So many times there would be camp meetings where there was very few African American people attending. And yet in that region or in that district, there would be African American churches. But then I would see that over, and I can't remember where it is. I think it's at Whitehall, the church. I think it's at the Whitehall camp where a lot of the African-American churches in Ohio will go over there and worship together. And there will be a few uh, white Christians that would go over there and worship with them. But, how, and yet I see this report of, hey, we're going to be doing church plantings in the state of Ohio. We're going to be doing this. We're going to be doing that. And yet... I have not seen anything that it says, hey, we want to unite. We want to have racial recon reconciliations with all the churches in the state of Ohio. We want them to be unified. Uh, I haven't really seen that. And I can even remember times. I remember as a young kid, there was a time where, where the, church that, the Church of God church that I was attending and the African-American church at God Church that was in the area, there was discussion of having a merger, of unifying, of being a, a basically a blended church of both whites and blacks. And I thought, hey, you know, that would be cool. You know, that was pretty exciting. I remember my dad would tell me about this, about some of the conversations that went on. And eventually they, we didn't do it. And I remember my dad kind of asked the pastor over at the African American church at the time and said, why, you know, kind of why, why, why are we not doing this? Like what's the major hang up? And my dad was thinking, well, maybe it had to do with leadership. Like who is going to be the lead pastor? Would it be a white pastor? Would it be a black pastor? Um, you know, or things like that, like elders and leaders, like a lot of the leadership thing, like how would that work? Or, you know, location, what church are we going to worship? Are we going to worship at this church? Are we going to worship at that church? You know, some of the structural things. And the thing that the pastor said, he said, you know, it's not any of that. That stuff could always get worked out. But kind of the driving force of why that unification never happened was the fear that the fear with the teens when you start having biracial dating. And how there may be some people on both sides of the church from the African-American community and from the Caucasian community that would not find that favorable. And that was kind of the issue. And I remember my dad said to the pastor says, I don't care what color my daughter would date or my son would date of the person that they want to date. As long as that person loves the Lord, that's the only thing I care about. And that was something that really stuck with that minister and, you know, kind of build a relationship from that. Cause I can remember when there'd be other church plants for African American churches. I remember my dad would take me there and believe me, that's a whole different experience, but it's an experience that I always remember. And, and I think about those, Moments, And I think about those conversations and I look what's happening here in the South where I am starting to see racial reconciliation within the Church of God movement here in a Southern state. And yet the Midwest can't seem to get their stuff together. And for me, and who knows, you know, I've been out of Ohio, Ohio for three years you know, hopefully there are some grounds to kind of do some reconciliation, to do those things and that, you know, and especially not only just relationally, but even um, structurally uh, with funding and everything else that Ohio Ministries is being supported by churches of different different ethnicities and different races. Like, I think that would be that would be great. But I almost feel like just for my experiences of being in the Midwest and being in the South, the South has done a lot more to try to bring racial reconciliation together and try to do this instead of what the Midwest is doing. And ultimately, my final thought on that is, with everything is that don't always assume 
that just because a racially tension situation happened in a southern state that that everyone in the south is racist that when they want to keep their confederate statues it's not because they're racist or they're holding on to to the glory days of the past and kind of remembering southern pride and everything else but mainly the main reason is just history of this is, you know, as a reminder of where we've been, what had happened, and how we have progressed. And those statues have become a marker uh, to that to see, hey, we have grown to become something better than what our ancestors have in the past. So as far as my final thoughts is don't judge a book by its cover. And when there's a community that has been hurting, you know, just don't speak and make it about a political opinion because that's kind of where we feel like we can do that now. We have the freedom to just make it. But sit, learn from the community, learn the facts of what's happened and learn from the community. And if you have the means and you're close by, invest in that community. Talk with people. Talk with the leaders on how you're doing, on how they're recuperating, how you can kind of help in the healing process when tragedy strikes a community. You know, that's what we see. We, that's the thing. We, we're too busy talking and voicing our opinion instead of actually making an effort to do something to kind of bring healing to those communities. So those are my uh, so those are my thoughts on Charlottesville. Um, hopefully you're able to process all the stuff I've said. Uh, again, thank you guys so much for listening to the show. Um, again, I'm I've mentioned at the end of the Camp Marengo stories that I am going to be experimenting with doing um, live video feed and hopefully be able to record the audio, but then also have a live feed where I can actually answer comments in real time because I know sometimes I always say hey guys if you have any thoughts on the show or if you have a question on anything I've talked about leave me an email message and sometimes I get those messages and sometimes I don't Um, so if I do decide to go live I'll make sure I will get that information Um, again uh, you can follow me on my website thescottsteadman.com you can also follow me on my Facebook page Scott Steadman at Scott Steadman Podcast um and yeah, thank you again. Thank you guys so much for listening. Obviously, this show would not be in existence without you guys listening to my crazy thoughts and opinions. So again, thank you guys so much. I hope you're having a wonderful week and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.